Pursuant to the Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975, this meeting is the newly advertised and separate from the final consent. The municipal clerk of the town is the newly identified by partners of those in the notice at the time. Who will please uh, stand for the public meeting? Public meetings to the five of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. everybody. Um, I'm going to do my best to get through this without needing a drink or a cough drop, another cough drop, or hacking. So <laughs> bear with me. I'm going to try to make it short and sweet. Um, my thing is not working tonight for some reason. Yeah, it's all in the light, but for some reason it won't advance the slide. All right, so taking a look at our end of the year data, one of the first things we're going to take a look at is the transfer in and out student data, Dibble's data, iReady reading, iReady math, the math interview um, or math reasoning inventory, depending on the grade level, and then take a look at how we did on our district goals for the year. 
Um, this is the first year that we've tracked the students transferring in and out of the district. We've been doing this by month. We reported out at our DLC meetings. I also reported out at our curriculum cabinet meetings at, uh, with the admin council. So taking a look, you can see here by every grade level in the chart, how many students transferred into the district and how many students transferred out. The number in parentheses says September because that encompassed the number of students that came in or out during the months of July and August as well. Um, by month on the left hand side you can see I highlighted January because that seemed to be where we had the most students come in and out. We had nine come in and eight go out in the same month. For our total so far we didn't have any in June so for the year we had 129 students enter the district and 84 students transfer out of the district for a total of 213 students which represents about 16 percent of our student population. So the next part of that is us working with Linkit to tie the mobility rate to our student data and getting all of that so we can pull the student data based on the students that have been here with us versus the students that have come later. The first thing we're going to take a look at is Dibbles and you'll notice in the square I added together the green and the yellow on here. On my screen they both look green, a dark green and a light green. The dark green is the core plus, which means students were above level, and green were students that were on level. So putting them together, um, I'm really pleased with the percentage of students that were on level or above for Dibbles uh, this school year. So by the end of the year in kindergarten, we had 67% of our kindergartners on level according to Dibbles. And remember I told you back in the fall that this was the lowest kindergarten class that we have had enter um, according to the uh, iReady data. So they made tremendous growth in kindergarten. First grade, 61% of our students are on level. Second grade, 52. Third grade, 48. Fourth grade, 47. Fifth and sixth grade had huge jumps, 65% and 69% of the students being on or above grade level for Dibbles. Taking a look at comparing that to last year. So the row across the top are last year's numbers. The row on the bottom, are this year's numbers. So taking a look, last year the kindergarten class ended at 56% of them being on level. This year our kindergarten class ended up at 67% of them being on level. They showed a lot of growth. You can look at this diagonally. So you can say the kindergarten last year in 2021 ended at 56% of them being on grade level and this year in first grade 61% of them. So there was an increase there. There was an increase from first to se well, first to second grade pretty much stayed the same, 52% of the kids being on level. Second grade, there was a drop. We, last year, the second grade class ended at 56% of them being on level. On third grade, 48% of them ended being on level. And same for third going into fourth, there was a dip there as well. Fourth graders going into fifth graders was a huge increase, 51% to 65%. And fifth grade going into sixth grade um, was definitely another big increase of 58% to 69%. This data is showing you each grade level from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So always, as I always tell you guys, you want to see the green get bigger and the red get smaller. Um, there is a little bit of concern with third grade. We had 42% were intensive for word reading fluency. Um, that actually the intensive area got bigger from the fall to the end of the year. Um, I did take a look back at this grade level when the pandemic hit they were in kindergarten and when we had that modified schedule of the cohorts A and B they were in first grade. Um, the oral reading fluency for accuracy for them though went from 33 percent intensive to seven percent intensive. So it was the, um, the one subtest area of word reading fluency that brought them down for the intensive. Same thing for fourth grade. Um, oral reading fluency, words read correctly. Our intensive level went up. And for Mays, our intensive level went up and that's how we assess comprehension. It could have been the passage that was used for the end of the year assessment when we were doing the individual 
student results. There were some students that scored lower than expected in all of their other, um, in Mays than in all of their other comprehension areas. So it was just something to take a look at. Also for fifth and sixth grade, you can see we definitely did better and there was growth. But when we're taking a look at the intensive, there's only a couple percentage point different. So I wanted to take a look at that. Um, that is also the oral reading fluency words read correctly component. It's weighted the most within the Dibbles composite score. Fifth and sixth grade is typically when we see that if a child is more of a slow reader and they're not going to get a lot of words read correctly in one minute on a time test. But we also take a look at that maze to make sure it's not impacting their comprehension and also taking a look at the iReady scores as well. Moving on to iReady reading, you can see this is from fall to spring and we had great growth in all areas. So just taking a look at the dark green is your mid or above grade level and we grew from 11% to 41% across the district. Early on grade level, we went from 16% to 19%. Uh, one grade level below declined, which is great, 49% to 28%. Two grade levels below, 17% to 8%, and three, to three or more grade levels below went from 8% to 4%. So we definitely saw a lot of growth in the iReady reading across the board. This is by grade level. So taking a look, remember I told you kindergarten, they were the class that wasn't really kindergarten ready. 92% of them were not kindergarten ready when they entered. And exiting, 66% of them were mid or above grade level. And 19% of them were early on, le on level and 14% of them were one grade level below. First grade, huge growth in first grade as well. Uh, the mid or above grade level went from 8% to 52%. And the early on grade level went from seven to 17. You'll note our yellow group, which is, we call them our tier two group, made the most growth. And we'll take a look at that later when we take a look at our district goals as well. This is from last spring to this spring. So when you take a look on here, they, if you remember in the winter, the national norm data was 1920 because that was the last time they had the whole population. Now for end of year, it's 1819. Because the pandemic hit in March of 1920, we did not do the end of year diagnostic. Nobody did the end of year diagnostic. So there was no normed data to go back to. Um, in 1819, only 977 students were assessed and that's because fifth and sixth grade, we're not doing iReady yet at that time. So when we're taking a look, there's a big difference between the number of students that were assessed in 21-22 and 22-23 compared to that and that is why. We did better than we did last year, and we're trending towards how we performed in 18-19 prior to the pandemic. When we're looking at us compared to the state, and then us compared to the national norm, we did better with iReady. So 40% of our students were mid or above grade level, and only 37% of the students in the state were mid or above grade level. And from 18, 38% of the students were mid or above grade level. Our um, one early on grade level was the same across the board. Uh, interesting, National, New Jersey, and us were all 19%. Uh, we did have the most students that were one grade level below, but we were the same when it came to two grade levels below at 8%, and we had lower than anyone at three grade levels below, according to the iReady reading. Some of the takeaways, they're gonna be the same as they were from the winter data. So the phonics instruction is working and it's impacting data in a positive way. Oral reading fluency accuracy continues to grow in grade levels two through six. Our interventionists are moving from phonics to vocabulary and comprehension interventions in grades three through six. And we're trending back towards the pre-pandemic levels. Some of our target areas in kindergarten and first grade was phonemic awareness and grade one through three, nonsense word fluency, correct letter sounds, automaticity in the phonics skills to meet the Dibbles one minute time subtests, vocabulary and comprehension. Um, I did wanna point out because phonemic awareness has been an area that we've struggled in for the last several years. And we really paid a lot of attention to that this year. And some of the coaches worked with some kindergarten and first grade teachers. And I just wanted to make sure that I let you know 
At the beginning of the year, 60% of the kindergarten class was intensive when it came to phoneme segmentation fluency. And at the end of the year, 40% of them were intensive. So we decreased that from 60% to 40%. Last year, 70% of the kindergarten class was intensive when it came to phoneme segmentation. They ended first grade at 8% being intensive for phoneme, for phoneme segmentation fluency. So the teachers are attacking it in their classrooms in different ways and we're having those conversations to figure out what are the best ways to do that and you can see the gains in what they're doing in their classrooms. For iReady uh, math, you're gonna see some major growth from fall to spring. At the beginning of the year, only 4% of our students were considered mid or above grade level and we ended the year at 41%. Uh, early on grade level, 12% of our population was, and now we're at 24%. One grade level below was 61% of our population. At the end of the year, we're at 28% being one grade level below. We went from 15% to 4% for two grade levels below, and 8% to 3% for three or more grade levels below. This is by grade level from fall to spring, and again, that kindergarten class is really impressive. 93% of them were grade level below when they entered and 66% of them are leaving mid or on grade level. You can see there's a lot of growth in first grade as well. Um, and across the board, the green got bigger. Some of the yellows got a little bit smaller or they could have even, I don't think any of them got bigger, but the reds all decreased as well. Uh, from spring to spring, so how did we do last year and then how did we do compared to 1819? We did better than last year and we're trending towards where we were during pre-pandemic. We're not quite there, but also remember 1819, there was only 978 students that were assessed because fifth and sixth grade are not counted in that data. So we were at 52% of the student population being on or above grade level and did this year at 40%. How did we do compared to the state and the national norms? So we did better than we did if we compare it to the state and the national norms for, this, for the end of the year. Looking at our math reasoning inventory and our math interviews. So math interview is K to two. Math reasoning inventory is grades three through five. The first one to the left is our kindergarten class. Um, and they take the whole numbers, math, re, uh, math interview, and they take it in the middle of the year and the end of the year. So you can see that, that they grew, 92% of them were on level in the middle of the year, 94% were on level at the end. Uh, the at risk, the yellow went from 8% to 6%, and the subtest where we saw the most challenge for our students was part, part, poll, and that was through first grade and second grade as well. Um, looking at first grade, you can see there's definite growth between 90% at the end of, hold on, 2021, sorry, yes, last, last year to this year at this time. So when they ended first grade last year and how they ended first grade this year. Um, in second grade, we had part, part, whole was the biggest concern for us as well as benchmarks five and 10 because that subtest, we had about the same number of students in um, the emergent category as we did last year. This is fall to spring. So in kindergarten, so if I confused you, the last slide was spring to spring. This slide is from fall to spring or middle of the year to spring. Um, in first grade, we went from having some emergencies at the beginning of the year to having zero emergencies at the end of the year and the at-risk population went from 11% to 6%. Um, again, part, part, whole was our biggest need. And in second grade, in the middle of the year, the students transition and take the multi-digit uh, math interview. And at the end of the year, they take that math interview as well. Um, you can see that the green got a lot bigger. So we went from 68% to 83% of the kids being on level. Uh, the at-risk and the intensive level also decreased and again, the part, part, whole, and the benchmarks of five and 10 were the, were the weakest areas. 
For grades three through six, this is third grade's first time uh, taking the MRI. They used to take the math interview. And taking a look at their data from beginning of year to end of year, they had great growth overall. The students in fourth grade, they made gains in addition and subtraction, and when reviewing the subtest data, did a little slide backwards on multiplication and division. So we'll be making sure that we check that when they take the MRI at the beginning of fifth grade. Um, in fifth grade, in the middle of the year, they transitioned to taking the fractions and decimals MRI. So they take that in the middle of the year and the end of the year. And in sixth grade, you can see there was great growth between the beginning of the year and the end of the year as well. Some takeaways for math, there was a lot of growth overall. Fluency in the math relationships is growing in the lower grade levels. Intervention needs are decreasing and remediation needs are increasing and that's exactly what we want to see. Trending back towards pre-pandemic levels, uh, we really wanna see our on-level and above-level students make more growth. Um, we're closing the gaps between the on-level and the below-level students and we're really looking to focus, and we have a goal for next year, focus on increasing student accountability and independence in math and having them be able to apply their strategies independently and confidently. So taking a look at the district goal, I put this slide up here because I wanted to take you back to last year. Um, our district goal last year was for our stretch growth. And overall, 62.5% of our students met their stretch growth target. We had taken a look at this data, um, and we were only expecting in reading 34% of the tier one students to, to meet their stretch growth. 27.5% of the tier two, uh, tier three was 22%. And we knocked it out of the park. Um, if you take a look beneath where it says reading, actually 40% of our students in tier one made that stretch growth, 32% in tier two and 30 and 24% in tier three. In math, we were shooting for 25%, 22%, and 20%, and we got 27, 30, and 23. So on this slide, if you look over on the chart for the 22, 23 school year, we originally had 39%, 32.5%, and 27% for reading, but we had already met it. So when we created the goal for this school year, we upped the percentage of students that we wanted to reach their stretch growth. So when we take a look at that data for this year, this is what we upped it to. So for 22-23, we upped it to 44% of tier one kids making their stretch growth in reading, 36% of tier two kids meeting their stretch growth, and 28% of the tier three kids meeting their stretch growth. For math, we wanted 35% of the tier one kids to reach their stretch growth, 34% of tier two, and 27% of tier three. So I know this will look familiar to the board, um, these slides. We had 65% of the students meet the stretch growth in math and 60% of the students meet the stretch growth in ELA, which again brings us back to 62.5% of our students meeting the stretch growth in the district overall. But we upped where we wanted them to be this year compared to where they were last year. So if we just look at the percentages, it might be a little bit confusing saying, well, we had 62 and a half last year and 62 and a half this year. I don't know that they made a lot of growth, but we made so much growth that we upped the bar to what we wanted them to meet and they were still able to meet it. So we did, if you look at ELA here, the tier two kids, every group of tier two met their stretch growth. We had three groups in tier one meet their stretch growth for ELA and in tier three fifth and sixth grade met their stretch growth goals and then for math we had all but one grade level in tier one reach their stretch growth and all but two grade levels in tier two reach their stretch growth when looking at iReady that's all I have for the student achievement data are there any questions on this I have a question as 
measures were submitted by Abby? Yes. To us to agree on both parties that that would be the district goal, correct? For the I ready you're talking about, yes. All right, just want to make sure. Um, all right, I have a couple questions. You may not, I just saw this at court, so you may not have the end of that finding and you want to email that to me. Um, how many, I know in the beginning you talked about the transfer information. Yes. How many transfers in are or were currently this year, for the year? How many transfers out were or are, were, when we are? We're in the left. Trish, do you have, I'm sorry, do you have those two questions? Yeah. Okay. And I can email them too. If not, I can ask yeah. Henry to write them down. Um, and I know we've had this conversation before how the rules in IREADY is, um, they don't match in regards to what it says our students are doing. Right. They're assessing different things. Um, again, why, why do we have, what is the discrepancy? What, what are we recognizing as the discrepancy between what they're telling us and what IREADY should well, we're definitely starting to see the the phonics and the phonemic awareness of iReady and Dibbles coming together, and that bigger disparity in the comprehension and vocabulary component. So that's from the iReady? From the iReady and looking at Dibbles together. So strengthening Dibbles, but we're also strengthening those subtests in iReady as well. So when we swung the pendulum back to that intervention and really focused on the phonics, skills for our basic skills students and when we put in benchmark workshop phonics for k through four we have it we have seen growth in those areas and now we're like okay we don't need the intervention as much as we used to we used to have a number of students in third fourth fifth and sixth grade that needed phonics interventions and we're not seeing that anymore we're seeing the interventions move more towards comprehension vocabulary and comprehension for literature and, and nonfiction text. So, if I'm understanding you right, then in regards to fourth grade and third grade, the needs are based primarily in comprehension as opposed to foundational skills? Yes, they're moving in that direction. Fourth grade more than third grade. At the beginning of third grade, we see that first intervention period still being more phonics, but we're, we're also able to bring more fluency students into the mix at that time. Um, how many students ended in this year for math and DLA? I know we only got numbers for first and sixth grade at the beginning of the year. Yeah, I have those. I, yes, I can give those um, to you. What is the number of kindergartners that are living kindergarten this year? Okay. Um, how many students are not in RTI but are in that bottom 40% in regards to our ready and or Okay. So, for instance, our, you know, our grade level two to three is a lot bigger than the number of students that we're um, that we are putting into a tier. So I'm just looking to see how many students are not the tier but are in that portion. Yes, so we started tiering those students as I, I started tiering them at a one point five is what I've been calling them. The where the remediation needs. So trying to so I will have those numbers for you pretty easily. Um, and we're able to give those numbers to the principals as well. So when they're rostering the students, they have tier two, tier three, and the 1.5s are the ones that still need support. They're not at grade level yet, but they still need a remedial support. So what are we considering a tier one? Our tier one is our on level. Okay, our, okay so we don't have a tier one, we just have tier two and tier three? No, we have a tier one. That's the tier one is all of our all of our students what they get in tier one in their classroom and then when we're looking at tier two and tier three we were looking at it through an intervention lens because our numbers were so great so what's the difference between a t1 and a 1.5 so a t between getting some intent some a T1, a 1.5 is a kid that just needs a little bit of support on grade level material where your tier two and tier three are more that intervention, like they're not, might not even be on grade level. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Jamie, have you guys considered removing that September data from the end now? We're actually going to do it differently this year. We're going to do July, August, September. Okay. And yeah, that. Yes, yeah. And so that's why when we were looking at it, Troy and I both decided moving forward and Chelsea has already created 
the Google Sheet for this coming year to start July, August, September, so we can tease them out even further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank <laughs> again. Okay, so this is our strategic plan update for curriculum and instruction. Um, our primary goal was to research and evaluate the changing mobility, mobility and transitory rate of students and how that mobility is impacting our curriculum and instructional needs of Franklin Township and develop a plan based on review and research for addressing the results of our analysis with our secondary goal looking at the need to include community-based programs to identify the potential effectiveness of onboarding, orientation and, sub orientation and supporting our mobile population. So I know this is very small, um, but just some of the goals that we've been working on. So transfer in and out procedure. So we have worked with the secretaries to have transfer out instructions. We've revised them, we've finalized them, and they will be used in all three schools starting in September. Um, we are starting a new student initial diagnostic and class placement method that we are piloting out. And then we have also created an exit survey. Um, trying to look at the logistics of what that exit survey is going to be, but when a, a parent comes in to transfer their students out, we've a, we've created a survey that we want them to complete. With it, that gives them a little gives us a little bit more information as to where they're going and why they're going versus just what school are they going to, what state are they going to. Um, we're we're looking to streamline the transition information between Jamvier, Main Road, and Ritter. So there's definitely some logistical and financial and coverage issues when we're having the students visit the other classes. Um, we talked about using technology, possibly allowing the second and the third grade students and the fourth and the fifth grade students some time via Google Meet or whatever to meet each other and talk about the next grade level and what to expect when they transition to different schools. Uh, we had a teacher survey that we developed for the transitional grades to identify what is working, what are we doing to get the students prepared and ready for the next school, you know, the next building that they're going to. And then what are some ideas that we could put into place to make it even better? Um, the principals reviewed those surveys and we sent out the, the dot for data collection. Um, so we'll be looking to continue talking about that area of our goal next school year and looking to see what we'll put into place as they transition at the end of next school year. We're still working with Delcy to create the memorialization document. We did have more articulation this year. I know the teachers were very uh, appreciative of that. Our related arts teachers and Delcy's related arts teachers met and had articulation in March and then our ELA math, social studies and science teachers went to Delcy at the May PD day for about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, for articulation with them as well. Um, taking a look at facilitation of middle school opportunities for sixth grade students. So Delcy coming to sixth grade lunch periods to engage um, informally with the student, meet and greet them. They don't really meet them before they come over there at the administration. Um, a future suggestion is to develop that meet and greet to include like I wish I knew. So focusing on those seventh grade students coming back to the sixth grade students. What did they wish they know when they got to Delcy that would have helped them transition over? Um, our student total time and month and our time in the district year and month and the transfer rate. So we've done the transfer. We're going to continue um, logging the transfers, analyzing that data. And Link It tells me that they are coming out with an update this summer where it'll be very easy for us to pull the student data in relation to how long students have been in our district. So I'm eager to try that out and see what that looks like as soon as they get that done. Um, this is something that Zach actually put together for us. He just did a little bit of digging um, and went back to the 16-17 school year and looked at how many students did we have in our district and then he did all of the work of comparing the student names and seeing who was still with us every single every single school year. So starting in kindergarten in 16-17 there were 176 students that entered kindergarten that year. When they got to first grade 160 of those 176 were still with us 
when we, they got to second grade, 150 of those students of the 176 were still with us. By third grade, we were down to 145 of the 176. Fourth grade, 134 of the 176. Fifth grade, 119. And sixth grade, 117 of the original 176 students that came in in kindergarten. So the chart below gives you the percentage. So 61% of the students were still with us by the, by the time they got to sixth grade. Um, he did that for every year. I'm, you guys can look at that yourselves. Um, the next slide is the total population. So how many students were enrolled? So the 176 students that came in in kindergarten in first grade, 160 of them were still with us, but we had 189 students in kindergarten at the time. So of the 189, 160 of them were with us in kindergarten. Are there any questions about how to read that chart? Everybody's okay with that? And then our, our we always say for our um, committee, data-driven and people-focused, so focusing in on that to make our decisions. Questions on the update? Yeah, I could look it up. No. Um, and I would just say, I mean, I know you're saying statistically it's really hard um, to get the kids physically into the schools, but personally, I would say if you can do it, you might do it we, we did yeah. do it, but we were talking about like having them visit classrooms and be able to go in. We're doing, instead of just kind of walking through yeah. the building, right. and then it's like finding coverage for those teachers so they could leave their current kids to talk to the kids coming in so we we do do that but it's more of just a tour so we were like what could we do to have them interact a little bit more Hopefully you guys can figure it out. Thank you. yeah you're welcome anybody else you're welcome thank you I'm good thank you all right, um, this is our first public portion, public comment session for agenda item uh, next session we have the public session. All in favor? Aye. Anyone from the public uh, motion comment regarding the item? I 
seen the picture uh, made it to the uh, PTS. I think it's more uh, school talent show rock. I uh, love how the kids and the teachers interacted. Everyone did such a great job. Uh, I've spent a time here this past month. I wish uh, I went to school there. Uh, Mr. Beers, Mary Kate, uh, made school there this month. Uh, uh, it's Mrs. Bellis' important uh, that she had four and seven. Uh, there they are. I attended um, Ritter uh, at the request of Michelle Bressler. Um, she was doing a project, a huge project, regarding the, the kids building mini homes, uh, library homes. And um, we, my son-in-law, my, myself, were invited because um, I serve as a nurse for Operation Safety and, and uh, he operates that um, Operation Safety and we're taking so the children have watched videos of Operation Safety and so um, they wanted to honor Donnie Davis um, as their local hero. And so we attended an hour and a half of so much enthusiasm. These children, um, their creativity, um, their excitement about giving a presentation to each, each of us, um, their groups, they were a real team three to four children per project, and they use their math concepts to devise these micro homes. And so, they, they were absolutely amazing. And um, I, I just want to thank Ritter for inviting us. Uh, I just want to myself, Leah, and Michelle were at the uh, sixth grade moving up ceremony. <laughs> she was there scared. <laughs> um, but it was very nice. You know, getting there was a little bit of a hassle, but once everybody got there, it worked out really well. So congratulations again to the boys and girls. Um, and good luck to them all the time. Thank you. 
Good evening, Mr. Brandt. Please. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. So I just wanted to, to, to speak to the board tonight about the continued dedication of the teachers in this district. Uh, Ms. Golden gave a great presentation on the data. Uh, I'm, you guys know I'm not one for data. It is what it is, but okay, it's there. All right. Uh, Mr. Walton, Mrs. Golden, some of the board members were at the play that Mrs. Lascala and uh, Mr. Griffin put together. They got stipends for that, but certainly the hours they put into that was significantly more involved than what, what they did. Mrs. Doyle, you presented our career day. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Roberts and I put that together. Uh, we had some scheduling issues with that. Uh, we put a lot of time in that. There was no stipend involved in that, but we did it for the children. Uh, you mentioned the enthusiasm that the children showed at the, at the Tiny House presentation, right? Uh, the enthusiasm that the children showed uh, at the talent show, along with the, uh, some of the teachers, uh, like uh, Mrs. Bowman and some of the other teachers, and one other person who also performed at the talent show. Uh, who shall remain nameless, but that's the exciting point. All right, the, the, the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is that the enthusiasm you see from the children comes directly from the teachers. Because we are so committed to what we're doing, and we continue to be committed to what we're doing. And I said this before, I'll say it again, business is business, all right? We can take business and separate it from the person. But the truth is, is that we continue to be committed in this district despite all of the changes that, that we, we've experienced, that you're aware of in terms of staffing, to make the best experience for the children in this district. And we will continue to do that. The bottom line is that we, the teachers, are professionals that care about the kids, and we would do nothing else but the best for our children. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Jenny Regioni, TFEA, Ritter School. We are losing teachers at alarming rate, as you guys know, and student growth, like Mrs. Dolan presented tonight, cannot happen without retaining the talented teachers. I would also like to add to the letter that was read earlier tonight about the Rinner events and how awesome they were, and acknowledge that all of my colleagues play a huge role in making those events successful and fun. Wednesday is a big day in our negotiations process. Our stance has been that the current offer does not meet our needs. My hope is that the board's negotiation team is open to really hearing our concerns and working towards a resolution. The kids of this community deserve the best. And speaking of the best, since the 2017-2018 school year, I would like to share some data with you. And I'm speaking from my own experiences with my colleagues I saw daily at Ritter School. 2017 ESP of the year, Lisa Wechter, forced into early retirement due to medical benefits issues. 
2018, ESP Teacher of the Year Kayla Calloway took her talents elsewhere. 2018, Educator of the Year Nick Carpo took his talents elsewhere. 2019, Educator of the Year and Gloucester County Teacher of the Year Jamie Centrella took her talents elsewhere. 2020, Educator of the Year Kelly Brown took her talents elsewhere. 2021, Educator of the Year Christina Lott, whose resignation you are accepting tonight, taking her talents elsewhere. I'm going to pass the mic to a colleague to read a letter that Chrissy wrote for tonight, and then followed by our 2022-2023 current Teacher of the Year, Beth Almer. Hi, I'm a rich. How you doing? I'm Arisha Sorzi, I work at, I'm a school nurse at Ritter. I don't usually speak publicly, but my colleague asked me to speak for her, she's not here, so I, uh, I accept it. Um, from Chrissy Lott. I recently made an extremely difficult decision to resign from my position as a fifth grade teacher. I have worked in Franklin Township for 11 years, and I'm one of the last four consecutive Ritter teachers I am one of the four consecutive Ritter Teachers of the Year to resign. She's very dedicated. She's very supportive. She's uh, genuinely very active in our school. She has uh, bonded many friends, family, and children. Um, this week, she ended the school year with many notes and support from her colleagues, staff, students, and parents thanking her for being the most positive teacher, having uh, her lessons are very fun. She's a very, the best math teacher. Parents also say that they are very sad that they're ending the year because they're gonna miss her. Uh, quotes, we hit the jackpot with you as our teacher. Uh, we want you to teach us in sixth grade. She did not tell her parents and students that she was leaving. She's a very confident person, a uh, very kind and generous person, that's coming from me, and, and very positive and supportive. She's not leaving the district for a month. She's um, been a teacher for 18 years, but she's leaving the district because of certain things that happened to her. One of them is um, severe lack of respect, appreciation, and acknowledgement of everything that she's done. Some of the things that she's done to our school has had planned many multi-school-wide assemblies and initiatives. One of them was being, and thought she dug, uh, dug the ground herself and planted herself Butterfly Memorial Garden for one of the teachers that passed away, and I'm sure all of you would know her. Yet, it has never been recognized in our town, in our community, or in our school. If no one has seen that garden, please take the time to look at it because it's absolutely beautiful. The teachers that are leaving this district are phenomenal, and I'm sure you all know that. Not everyone in these board meetings, she says not everyone at these board meetings seems to care, or at least she's saying they're not showing that they care. Uh, members of the TFEA, which is I right now standing, are reading out loud, you are listening, so I appreciate that. But she said that there's administrators and board members that have been seen typing on the computer, scrolling on their cell phones, and even flipping through magazines during our readings. And I'm, I think we're up here to try to make a point. She says, when I handed in my resignation, I was not told that it was so sad that she was leaving or don't go. I was not asked why I was leaving. She said I was met with a passive aggression. And I was told that they had already known about her interviewing and job acceptance. And they, and they said that they even looked up the board minutes and, and looked up her salary at her new district. Then she said, I was told that I should have helped out the administration by telling them as soon as I started interviewing. However, last week, my teaching practices were described and this is quote from an unquote from an administration as being unacceptable. And last week she received a letter of reprimand, and this is the first she's ever received 
in 11 years, and she was cited for being insubordinate because some of her students did not finish their eye ray diagnostic by the intended due date. However, on my last day of letter, I had an absolutely wonderful day with my students. Um, however, tears did not fall from my, from my face on her tears, she did not cry. Because the administration, she said, had broken my spirit. She says, I'm very hurt, I'm very angry for the way I was treated, especially my last week here at school, and I did not want to leave. However, when interviewing at the other district, she said they told her she was tremendously impressive. She was one of her favorite candidates. Were- she was a favorite candidate, and they're thrilled to have her join their school family. She said the board meeting was packed. Uh, families were there, and they were celebrating students. The teachers recognized. They recognized teachers. They- In other words, they recognized. Teachers. I didn't know a board meeting could be like that. She says, I'll miss my students, I'll miss my colleagues. That's from Chrissy Lott. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Beth Almer, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, Last week I submitted my letter of resignation. Uh, It was not a decision that I made lightly. Money, of course, played a factor. In moving to my new district, I lost a step, but it will be making $6,672 a year more. Over the course of my teaching career, that adds up to over $200,000 more than if I stayed in Franklin. That change not only helps my family day to day, but it means a lot for my pension and my retirement. The salary guide at my new district has 13 years to the top, ours has 19. I recognize that the grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence, but frankly, the money is. It is hard to leave my students, their families, and my colleagues. Over the last eight years, I calmed the fears of kids on their first day of fifth grade and hugged them on their Delcy grad walk at Ritter. I like and respect this community, and I love my students. I appreciate their families. I am inspired by my fellow teachers and staff members at all three buildings. I always thought I would retire in Franklin. However, it should be noted here that I did not start looking for another district just because I wanted to earn more money. There were other factors that caused me to begin my search as well. We have become a district that values testing over student well-being. In the month of May, the fifth grade students were tested almost every day. First state testing, then district testing. It's maddening and heartbreaking to watch these kids get tested until they break. For what purpose? The curriculum office uses this data, but it mostly means less teaching time for a teacher and less time learning for our students. We focus on iReady data where we encourage the very challenging stretch growth rather than celebrating student progress and their hard work, which aligns with our standards-based grading model. iReady focuses on skills that might not even be tied to classroom standards or what is being taught in the classroom, but we still hold it up as a major reflection of how a teacher teaches or how or what a student learns. Again, the data may be analyzed by the curriculum team, but as teachers, we have very little voice in what that data means, the patterns and lessons we learn from it, or the curricular decisions that are made as a result. This can't possibly be good for students. While data may have value from an evaluative purpose, and I'm a special ed teacher, we kind of geek out about data, data does not show the most important part of education, making our students better people. Speaking candidly, I encourage the board to look at morale. Franklin is a tough place to teach. Morale is very, very low, even when we have a contract, and morale reflects leadership. Sure, we have t-shirt days and super fun things like the color run or first Fridays, but what we don't have is an environment where teacher input is welcome and celebrated. When you ask a question, it is shot down or you are accused of being negative. Trust your teachers enough to give us a voice and listen when we speak. Consider that our opinions come from a place about caring or of caring about our kids, advocating for our kids, and knowing our kids, not from a place of negativity. I strongly encourage the board to put into place a teacher liaison between the board and the teachers. There is so much that happens in this district that you don't have, that you do not know about. You may take steps to fix our contract, but unless you address teacher morale and respect, teachers will continue to leave in droves. Things like an SEL picnic are great, but if there is not a district culture of kindness, compassion, and mutual respect that starts from the top, then are you really the kind of district that you claim you are on Twitter, or are those events merely for appearances? 
You guys have repeatedly asked what is wrong with the board contract. While I cannot speak to the specifics of the proposal from the board, I ask you to consider a couple of things. As a special education teacher, I ask the board to examine the workload of your special education teachers. On average, a well-written IEP takes between one and four hours to write. My caseload this year was 27 students. Mathematically, that is between 27 and 100 eight hours spent writing high quality IEPs. That time does not fit in the school day. Sure, we have preps and we can get some of it into the school day, but a majority of IEP writing is done after school, before school, at night, and on the weekends. Special education teachers are not asking to work less just to be compensated or given release time for the IEP workload and the time outside of our contra contractual work day that it takes to produce the quality of work that we do. I also ask you to consider our teaching minutes. If you plan to increase the teaching minutes of your teachers, you should be willing to pay your teachers for those minutes. I also encourage you to look at what we are currently doing during the enrichment time. That time, especially at Ritter, is used to remediate for students who are struggling, to enrich instruction for students who need it, to check in with students who have missed school, to check in on student well-being, for students to receive related services, and to be present for students to ask questions and request help. It is also the time when our students are able to meet with their classmates to work on projects and be creative with school spirit initiatives. Our teachers know what to do with this time and are fully and appropriately using it. We do not need direction or changes. The quality and caliber of teacher and staff you have in this district are exceptional. The innovation in the classroom and dedication to our students is apparent. That innovation has resulted in Career Day, Ram Strong, First Friday, and many programs at all three buildings. I have learned so much from my colleagues at Ritter, Main Road, and Janvier. Instead of being treated as replaceable, you should be celebrating what these amazing teachers do every day for less pay than they are worth. You should be grateful for the teachers who stay. You should worry about the crazy amount of stress and pressure these teachers teach through daily. I feel fortunate to have taught with all of them. Look at the ex exit surveys from your, from your staff who has left. They have similar themes. Great colleagues, low pay, low morale, poor school climate, too much stress. Ultimately, as the board, you answer to the taxpayers, but the responsibility for the decisions and the education of this community fall to you. Pay your teachers, keep them here, listen to them, ask questions, value teacher expertise, and put the students first. Thank you. Good evening, Stacy. What was that? Good evening, evening Stacy Swope. TFEA member and fourth grade teacher at Main Road School. Students need continuity and stability in the classroom. Instead, Franklin Township has turned into a stepping stone district with um, teachers leaving rapidly. We have lost 70% of the certified staff since 2018. And who can blame the teachers? They are leaving and making five to thirty thousand more dollars a year to work in other districts that have more positive morale and climate. However, this Board of Education could em implement changes that aid teacher retention, and those changes cost little to nothing. First, why do we still have recess duty in Franklin Township? Other districts have recess and um, lunch aides who supervise the students at recess. And these districts all know that teachers' time is better spent off the recess field. Second, what would it cost the Board of Education for the teachers to finally have a fifth prep? A fifth prep is not a bargaining tool and it's not a luxury. A fifth prep is necessary to develop highly reflective and highly effective practitioners. Data was collected from 14 elementary school districts in Gloucester County. 14 of the 14 districts reported that their teachers have five to six prep periods a week. The fifth prep is not used for weekly meetings as they are here. Teachers are permitted to use their professional judgment and have PLCs as needed. In some of these districts they have PLCs 
um, during early dismissal days, others during PD days, and at others during homeroom with classroom coverage provided. Um, in the one district, only eight hours per school year was required for PLCs. In this district, we don't have true PLCs. Um, PLCs are short for professional learning communities, and they were meant to be action research based so that teachers could collaborate and work together on a common area of interest or an identified area of weakness. What we do in our district is teachers regurgitate information from the school and district leadership committees. That information could easily be placed in an email or later relayed at the next faculty meeting or the next professional development day. If this Board of Education truly values teacher retention and a more positive teacher morale and district climate, I would ask that you implement changes that reflect your beliefs, values, and initiatives. In closing, I would like to thank the amazing TFEA Negotiations Committee for their ongoing hard work and dedication the past 12 months in standing firm and strong for a fair contract. Thank you. Henry Kovic, President of the Township of Franklin Principal and Supervisors Association. I just wanted, on behalf of my organization, our organization, and myself, uh, to thank the Board of Education Negotiation Team, uh, as well as Mr. Brandt, Mr. Walton, Ms. Birmingham, uh, for the negotiation process that is concluded. Uh, also, expressing gratitude for the approval of our contract this evening. So it was professional, it was efficient, it was comprehensive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. King, for all the things you all prepared to address the process and all the same. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, Lauren Lascala, uh, Ritter School. Um, sorry, I have nothing prepared, but I just kind of felt moved to come up. I won't take much of your time. I appreciate the time that you've given me. Um, I have to tell you, I am one of those teachers that I don't have a plan on going anywhere. Um, I plan on making Franklin Township my home. Um, this is where I'm going to be, hopefully, until my career takes me in a different direction, possibly through administration. Um, this past year, um, I'm losing two phenomenal hallmates this year, um, and I took the time to mentor someone this year. Um, did a great job. He was learning really, really well. Unfortunately, he has decided to move on. But as someone who has been working in this district for eight years, and a veteran teacher, I start to get a little worried, not just for me, but um, for my administrators as well. Um, I start to think about their morale and how invested they want to become in the, you know, in the new people who are constantly coming in. I start to feel depressed. <laughs> I start to feel sad and removed from the new people who are coming in and I don't want to develop strong relationships with them not because I don't want to but for fear that I'm going to make this great relationship and then they're going to move on. So that's that's just where I am. I just felt like I needed to get that off my chest and I just I feel you know, I, I start to feel bad for the administrators, like I said, as well, and, and the revolving door that they have to constantly go through with interviews. I mean, I've sat in on those interviews, and I've seen job offers given to some really great talent who unfortunately go somewhere else for, for other reasons. So um, I just want to thank you for your time and encourage you guys that as you guys go into negotiations with our phenomenal negotiations team, um, that you really listen to the teachers and, and understand where we're coming from. So, thank you very much. <clears throat> Hi.
Hi, Tasha Bowman. Um, I am a, a member of our community and fifth grade teacher at Ritter. I did not plan to say anything tonight, but what Lauren shared with you kind of sparked something in me, and I just wanted to share. My daughter just graduated from Delcy on Thursday. It's very exciting. Um, and she did her senior grad walk through the schools, and there were only um, two teachers that she knew. Um, throughout all three of the elementary schools that she was able to see that day and that same day that's sad I mean it's just it is it was sad of course she knows all of you but <laughs> um, but I, I happened to go to Wawa to get gas later that day and I saw one of my first year students um, and was so happy to see him and I and he was in two days going to be a senior and I said oh my gosh you're gonna be a senior in two days and what he said to me really hit home he said are you gonna be there for my grad walk I swear on my children that that was the first thing he said to me and I just looked at him and I said I will be because like Lauren I want Franklin Township to be my home but I also need more and the more that I need is to be respected as a professional not only you know from our administrators but from the board you should know me you should know who I am as a person and you should speak professionally to me at these meetings and that's what we ask for and so many of those letters I mean we speak to our children with respect. We do everything with our students because we love them. And that's what we're asking of you. Thank you.